for a long time I had regrets because I thought there was if I had committed to it, you know, full time, like if I had committed to the comedy thing from the age of 20, not gotten married, not had kids, not moved to California to 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 continue to work in commercial filmmaking, not, you know, not remarried, got a divorce. If I had just focused on just being a stand up comedian, I could have I would have made it. Welcome to Give a Heck. I am your host, Dwight Heck, and for much of my life, lived my life in quiet desperation, wondering how I was going to pay the bills, take vacations, save for retirement, and one day wondering if I would get off the hamster wheel of life and have purpose. A life that most of society lives, which takes us to work, then home, then repeat, and pays us hopefully enough just to survive. The harsh truth that most live with more months than money and have no idea how to live life on purpose, not by accident. This ensures the mass majority are living not just financially broke, however emotionally and mentally as well due to financial pressures. In each episode, I will introduce you to thoughts, ideas, and guests that can help you to learn how you too can live life on purpose, not by accident. Good day. And welcome to Give a Heck. On today's show, I welcome Hirsch Repoon. With dual careers in stand-up comedy and advertising, Hirsch operates on a one single principle, sell the truth. He appeared in comedy clubs across the U.S. and his clients include change makers, market leaders, ad agencies, educational institutions, and Oscar-winning filmmakers. As a host of the increasingly popular Truth Taste Funny podcast, Hirsch explores the absurdity of life's challenges while engaging with experts who have dedicated themselves to finding serious solutions. He also hosts the Yes Brand podcast, helping business owners design breakthrough messaging and build trust with their audiences. I'd like to welcome you to the show, Hirsch. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on and share with us some of your life journey. Thank you, Dwight. It is wonderful to be with you today. I uh, absolutely. I, I always enjoy speaking with you, and <laughs> uh, and but we haven't recorded many times, so this is uh, it's an honor to be on the uh, Give a Heck podcast. Yes, it's a, it's an honor to joke with you. Prior to recording, you and I all well, we met listeners. We met last fall in um, Hirsch is an American. We won't hold that against him. We met in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> in Toronto, Ontario at an event, and we became fast friends. He is an absolute hoot. Um, great guy, so full of knowledge. So I look forward to, you know, picking your brain and getting those big nuggets out for to share with my listeners so that they too can learn to give a heck about their lives and move forward and realize part of that journey is, is humor. So um, Hirsch, one of the things I focus on, I always remind people in, my, in the podcast because of new listeners that pop on, I like knowing people's origin story from their earliest childhood recollections to where they are now. It helps build a quicker connection to the listener because now they get to hear some vulnerability or you know things that you might not share with others so that they can immediately know, like, and trust you. And then the knowledge that you're going to give us means that much more. So could you do me a favor, brother, and share me your origin story from your little tiny wee Hirsch to where you are today? Well, my origin, my origin story was, was published in, uh, in episode 16. Of episode the 16. Hirsch, Hirsch Repoon comic, comic book saga. Um, <laughs> it actually was before Ant-Man. They had. Oh, they, wow. Yeah. The, the, the Ant-Man is really a ripoff of my original comic which is aunt and uncle man which was <laughs> which was uh it's all about family for me i i started in miami i grew up in miami beach i was it's it's funny because you know you do you do a lot of shows and you can you can fall into this pattern of of just kind of giving your your uh your prepared prepackaged origin story but in but in fact i was just thinking about i loved i had a very happy childhood i was very fortunate um, I grew up in Miami beach, so I was in, in great weather when it wasn't super hot and sticky, but I, but it was a wonderful, 
uh, town to grow up in. My parents were were really warm and funny. And I think one thing that that you know yesterday for us was uh, Holocaust Memorial Day. And um, and my father lost a lot of his family in the in the Holocaust. And his his uh, siblings, he has he had two older siblings, a brother and sister, and his parents were fortunate enough to escape uh, Germany and get to New Jersey. They had a relative in New Jersey. And, um, you know, the and so yesterday I was reflecting on the realities of what those people went through, you know, losing family seeing them murdered. I don't, I don't want to start on like kind of a downer note, but it's a, but it was, it was yeah, it's a, reality uh, though. It doesn't have to be a yeah. downer. It's reality. Yeah. It's not, it, it's not. Yeah. So, and, and the important thing is I think the more we remember and commemorate the tragedies that, that we've been through, whether it's trauma that we've experienced or our families, the less likely we are to repeat those, those patterns. And, um, and my point being that, you know, my so my father lost his grandparents, right? And his great grandparents. And you know, you're right. You okay? Um so so <laughs> he had he had he had you know, we don't think in those in those terms really like, oh, you know, my grand my grandparents were were murdered in a in a mass, you know, genocide. Like like if somebody were to say that without the context of the Holocaust, it would be it would be shocking almost. But when someone says, oh yeah, my, I, they perished in the Holocaust, people kind of, you know, think of it as almost normal. It's, oh yeah, well, they perished in the Holocaust. It was just something that happened. Well, it becomes so, dismissive. Yeah. It becomes like, you know, like because there were 6 million of them, it's like, it becomes kind of matter of fact or globalized. Um, so in any event, the fact that he was able to, uh, grow up with this incredible sense of humor, but also an acknowledgement of that trauma and that pain so that it wasn't like, oh, I'm fine. You know, a lot of people go through trauma and they say, oh, I'm fine. You know, it's okay. And they're just pushing it down, pushing it down, pushing it down. You know, he was in touch with the reality and growing up as a, as a, as a young man in the United States and, you know, seeing what people had to go through to survive anyway, uh, you know, after losing everything, you know, people who were very successful in Germany had to start over in, in, you know, New Jersey or New York or Florida or Indiana or wherever they ended up in the United States um, and build again in middle age with, with a young family. Uh, it's just hard to underestimate how difficult that was. And sometimes when you meet people, and they just have a huge smile and just so much warmth and so much humor, you know, you wouldn't know what they've been through. And I find that now as an adult quite, quite often talking to people, I would never know what they, what they went through because of the gratitude and the energy and the sweetness that they bring. But that may be part of that puzzle that, that people bring such positivity often when they have experienced the opposite to the extreme. And so they've made a choice. I'm going to bring positronics to the conversation because I know what the alternative looks like. And I, I don't want to go back there or go there again, or go there like my, you know, my ancestors or my, or my parents or whoever it might be. So it was an interesting upbringing where uh, the upbringing itself was so wonderful, but there is that inherited trauma and whether you inherit it genetically or you inherit it, you know, just literally culturally from the, from the family, there's that thing that I'm aware of that hangs over the world. And, uh, and obviously it's not localized to, you know, the Jewish people or, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's, that's um, endemic in, in uh in human nature and in our species so that's where i think my like truth tastes funny podcast comes from i think the the whole balance of 
uh, of happiness and sadness and tragedy and victory and, you know, success, failure, pain, joy, all those, all those two sides are ever present. They have to be ever present though, yeah. because unfortunately yeah. we don't want to go through all that trauma, but without tragedy or without discovery of our history, whether it's history that we've lived through or it's because of what our parents or grandparents went through how do we know the opposite of and, and experiencing joy I, yeah. I i hear that from people all the time i just want to be happy all the time well that's unrealistic right yeah. it's it, you're gonna go through challenges it, it you know and the biggest thing is is people just need to realize that life isn't life isn't hard but it's not easy either you got to put some effort in you got to accept the past. And like you said, you don't want to always share it because right. you're wondering what people are going to think, or you don't want to peel off that band aid and open up the wound again. And, but it's, it's great that you share that because so many people do do that. They hide, right. They don't, yeah. they don't face their truth. They're running away. There are people that I know that are, that spend their whole lives running away and you wouldn't even necessarily know it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they're not really run. They're not literally running away. They're not irresponsible. They're not unreliable. They're not really run, but that, but just internally and sometimes in their relationships, they're just really running away. And that's, you know, a shame because there's probably stuff that they're missing out on. You know that they're 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 not they're not seizing, but they don't want that pain. They just don't want to deal with that pain. They don't want to go there, so they're just going to go the other way. How much of that, though, do you think is because you think about all the stories as we grow up and we listen to or experience to our parents? So you've probably heard a lot of different things from your own childhood that makes it so that we have that tragedy stuck with inside of us. And it silences our ability to flourish as we grow. Um, I think it happens a lot personally. And mm -hmm. our school systems, our families don't know how to compartmentalize in a certain sense and, and talk about it, but then also help us grow past it. All we hear about is the talk and not anything after the fact and hang on to it, as you said, right? So how do you think is, what do you, what's your thoughts about that? About what? About about our childhood and how how our, the stories get told and we hang on to it because we hear uh, it, but we really don't. We aren't really taught how to get past it because all we hear is the negativity. We're not part of the conversation. We're not part of the solution of their healing through it. Maybe they're just talking about it with somebody, and we yeah. run off as a child and we don't hear that the secondary part of the conversation and how how they maybe are dealing with it by talking about it. Right. It's it's yeah. a living it's it's a verbal healing. And it depends where the talking about it is coming from. Like with my parents, for for better or worse, because they were both very they were very different from one another in their approach. But what they had in common was this this need to confront the truth about whatever was happening. So they that kind of put pressure on us as kids to like feel almost compelled to tell the truth, even though you, you, you know, you, it wasn't like, don't lie to me. It wasn't like that kind of thing, but it was the opposite. It was, it was knowing that there would be this disappointment if we, if we hid the truth, if we didn't cop to something, if we didn't admit something. And so, you know, I think when you're coming from that place, you feel like there's almost a problem solving aspect to bringing up the past or bringing up the the trauma you know the goal is not to to live in the trauma all the time or to blame somebody else or to put it on something or deflect or all the, it's to heal and it's to grow and so you you kind of take those stories for a purpose whereas other times we may hang around with our bad memories because we want somebody to pay or we want somebody to suffer or they want us to suffer. It's like, why, why bring this stuff up if you're not going to use it for something good to heal? 
So, yeah, that makes sense. You know, I think I think it's the same thing with like, you know, the Holocaust Memorial Day. It's like, OK, well, if everything was perfect in the world and there was no residual hatred or ill treatment of anyone in the world and it was a utopia. Yeah, we probably could do away with commemorating horrors. You know, why why would we need to revisit them? But I think the world in its current state is evidence enough that you never get away from that stuff. So it's healing for the people who are closest to it and affected by it. And it's uh, it's cautionary for the rest of us. Yeah, it makes that's a good way to put it. Um, there's so many different you know, things that happen throughout the year where people are reflecting on specific events that have happened in history and tragedies. And so many people just want to forget the past, but you know, the history is important, right? It's important for us to acknowledge, like you were talking about for yesterday, it's important to acknowledge whether or not it was part of my history or not. It's important for me to acknowledge that, and the yeah. fact that somewhere along my lineage, I might have been part of that, not necessarily directly, but my ancestors were part of, of war or strife or, you know, taking people out of the equation, right? Literally, yeah. it, it, it's important that we acknowledge that because it continues to help, hopefully help most of the majority of the people realize that, you know what, that can never happen again. Oh, my goodness. I acknowledge what's gone on in the past and I see it happen again in the future. How can I help? What can I do? Right. It may not happen the same way, the Holocaust, but there's still things that happen throughout history. Today's present history that's being created, like in Ukraine and what's happening to the people in Ukraine. And are we speaking up about it? And if we're not, you know, brought to the forth, the past of history and saying like, look what happened back in with the Holocaust, that was terrible. And we allowed leaders and people to control a specific portion of the population and label them. And now it's happening in some ways again, right? Yeah. Not saying yeah, it's the and, same, but it's something that we need to acknowledge no, but and, it's, and do different. Yeah. And I mean, there's an Instagram account that I follow called Black and Jewish Unity. And I just love that. I love the stuff they put out there because on any given day and any given moment, every, any given post, the stuff can be relevant to the black community, to the Jewish community, to humans as a whole. And we feel this sense of shared obligation. So it doesn't, if, if they were to put out something, you know, uh, about, uh, about, you know, uh, uh, a shooting of a black teen that is as important to the followers of that account as you know something that happens in in israel or terror attack or something like that where jewish innocent you know blood is spilled and it's and and then this circle of caring just continues to to grow because well if i'm going to care about this person i'm going to care about that person then you start to be sensitized and you start to to feel the pain of other people and you feel that they understand your pain. And that's so much more gratifying and healing than if everybody just has their own, you know, account for their own community or their own cares and their own problems. And then if something similar is happening somewhere else in the world, well, who gives a shit? Because it's not, it's not my, it's not my thing. So I like the idea that we can all kind of take a little responsibility and interest in one another and in oh, our absolutely and in, in you know and in those in those problems and to uh you know to lighten it up a little bit uh to realize that it isn't just Kanye <laughs> you know he's not he's he's not really the problem oh my um, gosh you know, he's a problem. He's he's I was just going to say that. Yeah, he's problematic. But that's, you know, but uh, and I don't know what happens. Th- this goes to the to the the loony bin, the dangerous loony. You know, when I was when, when I was younger, cra- like crazy characters outsized 
nuttiness was so fringy. It was not, it was so outside the norm that people would say, oh, well, that person's just nuts. That person's a friend. Now it's, it's integrated into the fabric of society where uh, a person who's that nuts can be part of, you know, like the normal conversation. And but people and, give and, them a stage though. Yeah. And they get a stage be, because they're a be, freak. We live in yeah. a freak show. We live yeah. in a freak show uh, so, society. And we got it. We're in a society where people such as Kanye can say things and he gets a platform. He gets that stage constantly. People, well, it's all based on on capitalism, really. It's all based on money. So why are these media outlets or people posting about it or writing about it? It's because it creates interest, sells advertising, makes money, right? Yeah. In, in my opinion, it's 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 just, it's false. They, they might not even agree with Kanye, but it, hey, it sells stuff, right? It's just, yeah. it's sad that, Somebody like that can spew the stuff that he gets, uh, or part of me believes in, and that people give him that constantly, give him that platform. And then they talk about all the other. We could talk about him forever. Then they talk about all the things that he's lo losing. Oh, I'm so sad right. that he's losing all these, you know, these endorsements and all this money. Boo hoo! Right. <laughs> Right, shut your pie hole, buddy, and and go slide under a rock like the snake you are. But anyway, we'll yeah. move on from Kanye. Anything, anything else you want to add in regards to your origin or? Yeah, this is only the origin story part. This is yeah. the, and that this isn't even any of the other. Of the yeah, yeah. So exactly. So so moving on from there, uh, while my birth was uneventful, um. <laughs> About <laughs> six weeks later. No. <laughs> so, um, About six weeks later, I got up and ran. <laughs> I got up and ran. I was running at six. Um, at six weeks, six days. Uh, yeah, no. Um, well, what? So when you talk to people about their origin story, what, what, it, what are the, what are the, the pivotal ideas that you're Use looking for that are well, going to be helpful for your interview? It's not necessarily anything that I'm looking for pivotal. Some people's origin stories, I've had people that it takes literally 45 minutes of the of the conversation. And because the their origin stops and they have convers we have a conversation like you and I were just doing, yeah. and then all of a sudden they'll they'll start talking about their something that traumatized or something happy. It doesn't have to always be sad about right. their childhood going into teenage or they had this happen as a teenager this teacher did this for them good or this teacher did this bad or their best friend who they thought they could trust it you know what i mean it's stuff like that it's whatever is on you know on your mind on your heart that whatever there are that the you milestones share. yeah it doesn't have the, to be i'm not that. looking for anything specific if it flows and we ask more questions great if not if it's just a simple origin then i go into my questions sometimes i never get to the questions because the origins too juicy it, it right. can't be left behind it needs to be addressed and it helps yeah. i get guests that'll tell me hirsch honestly that you know they'll reach out to me or they'll even say during this show that th they loved it because of the fact that they've never shared that or never felt they had the opportunity or, or their own stage or platform to share some of the things that happened and they have those aha yeah. moments right that's really interesting because i i I don't know why I don't know why. I think it started it started I mean it could have been it could have happened anyway. You know, the pandemic was such a strange event that it accelerated a lot of things. It kind of, you know, as many things that got put on hold because of the pandemic were accelerated and largely involving our inner uh thoughts, our time that we spent alone thinking about stuff, working on ourselves. Like things that we wouldn't do if we were just doing our regular work and distractions and business and all that. So I think I went on kind of a a little bit of a journey. Um, I just finished I just finished uh, uh, an initial draft of my book, my first book, and um, and it's like part memoir and part part uh, business, you know, nonfiction book. Um, but I did. I had an opportunity to be introspective 
which is nice. Like when I was doing stand up comedy more, stand up comedy has, you know, you can get, you can wrench your guts for all kinds of stuff. I covered, you know, suicide in my stand up. I've covered, you know, like, you know, family disappointments and, uh, you know, and, and DUIs and all kinds of things that have been covered in my stand up. But I think in the book, it was a chance to really sit there with just me and the piece of paper and write some, some deeper, some deeper thoughts and explorations. I really, I really enjoyed that, uh, that process, but I think, you know, I'm I'm in a I'm in what I would consider to be a a more emotional state the last you know maybe year than I had had been for a number of years prior. You I know, hear that so. from a lot of people though. Yeah, the pandemic, like myself, just like you, I accomplished things that other people wouldn't have thought of me doing because in my normal day-to-day -day life if the pandemic wouldn't have happened i wouldn't you wouldn't you and i wouldn't know one another this podcast right. wouldn't exist i reframed my life did i go through challenges trials and tribulations during the pandemic absolutely but i kept on remembering what one of my friends well he's a friend of yours now too tony said where are you going to be on the other side of this he said yeah. that within the first week of the pandemic lockdown, and we were on a call, yeah. a bunch of us. And he says, where are you guys going to be at the end of this? We don't know where the end's going to be, weeks, months, years. Where yeah. are you going to be? Are you going to sit and feel sorry like the rest of the world and engulf yourself in all the misery and the, the negativity? Or yeah. are you going to realize that's going to happen regardless, understand it as best you can and can tolerate and pivot? reframe your yeah. life and move forward and that's what i did so and you talked about your book brother like same as me it was like very introspective it was very cathartic for me to sit and work on that book because then it became about me and one of the yeah. biggest things that people don't get that if you don't understand you and you don't love you and you don't let go of all that stuff that's stuck and put it on paper and share it to the you know yes Maybe you share it to 10 people by it, maybe 10,000 people by it, but it's cathartic for me. I did my book for me. And that was one of the yeah. things, a big realization I had to realize that I wasn't doing it for others. It was, oh, I was doing that's it for me, right? I was doing it for me. And then because I did it for me, my genuine person came out from the book like you. It has some personal reflection, talk about some of my origin it talks about my life as I move forward into where I developed throughout the pandemic. So it was very cathartic for me. And now it's become my business card, if that makes sense. For yeah, no, I totally like it, trust get, me. I totally get that. And I didn't I didn't write mine for cathartic purposes. I wrote it for my kids who are, you know, three of whom are adults and geared it really toward young adults who are trying to figure out business trying to figure out life and all that stuff and i just i just what what that did was created a standard for the book because if it has to be good enough for them right it has to be you know really good i don't want it to be useless or just an indulgence you know oh you know some silly stories or being being flippant or I really yeah. wanted to, you know, dig down and say, what do I have to offer? What am I, what am I saying about this subject, which is selling the truth? That's what the book is called. That's what it's, that's what it's about. So it starts with selling the truth as a kind of a work practice, as a business practice, as for brands. But it really does go into the personal because what if it's the truth, then it's got to come from somewhere. You know, the truth isn't that that a, a Twix bar is, is delicious. You know, that's, that's a, a factor, an attribute what's in it, but what are you really selling? What is your, what, what is really motivating you and what are you going through? You know? Yeah. So, uh, so well, I, when I, I talk I, about, when I talk about being cathartic though, it was what the end result was. It wasn't yeah. my intent. It wasn't my intent with writing the book. It just ended up being very cathartic as I, 
changed chapters, edited it, set it up to the editors, went back and forth. I thought I real I had moments when I'd be writing or I'd be rereading a chapter where I'd just like, oh my gosh. And I'd have that aha moment. And mm-hmm. I, it would be like, wow, I actually put that down in writing. Yeah. I didn't realize yeah. that was something that was real within my mindset. Right. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate the fact that I can't wait for it to come out now. Cause that's okay. definitely, that's definitely something I will read. Um, but yeah, mine was, I did it. I did mine as part of, part of it would be a legacy play too. So that, you yeah. know, if something happens to me, my grandkids that aren't even alive yet can read about grandpa. And this was his starting life. This is where he evolved from, you know, six days old running <laughs> right. to getting, to getting to a point where, he was going through some trauma and decided uh, uh, something called the pandemic happened and he pivoted and changed his life. Right. Yeah. And I plan on writing some other books, right. I, uh, now that I've got the taste for it. No, the yeah. Ta- yeah. The taste, the taste for my truth. Right. Obviously yeah. it only can be my truth. It's something I want to continue to share, but you doing it like truth tastes funny. Um, the whole principle of, of, what you believe in regards to the truth and why it needs to be shared really excites me in the sense that I can't wait to have somebody else's perspective. And that's what we all need. We have our own truths, right? Hirsch, we have our own truths, but do we listen to other people's truths and use that as a stepping stone to, to, to continue to peel back the layers of our own truth because now we're hearing somebody else's perspective and what we thought to be the truth. Now we can go, you know what? That wasn't true. I believe that because of all this extraordinary yeah, external yeah. inputs. And now truth, truth, you know, you with your truth makes me think different and makes me continue to elevate and climb in life. So that's why I'm excited for your book. And I hope the listeners, you know, once you do release your book, obviously, let me know because I'm going to share it with all my social media fam and make sure that people realize, you know, this is something that's important for you to invest in for your own truth development. Thanks. Thank you, Dwight. Yeah, no, that's great. I may send you, if you're interested, I may send you a, uh, a beta, you know, manuscript and get just your feedback. I would do that. I would love to. You I would, know, I would love to get that. I sent mine off to a few people. I sent mine off to Tony. So those listening yeah. that are new, our, our mutual friend, Tony Watley, did the forward from my book. And I sent him a free copy of it because I asked him to do the forward. And like he said, well, I can do a forward, but I also want to read the book first. Well, great. No problem. Right. There you go. <laughs> right? right. And I sent it off to him so that he could write the forward for the book. And I have no, no problems investing in my friends, those that I care for. And I'd be honored actually. That would be fantastic. So yeah, I would love to get your feedback. So yeah. What else? What else? (laughs) Okay. Well, Hirsch, you have dual careers in stand-up comedy and advertising. They seem to be, they seem to be so far out, like one left field, one right field in regards to careers, which came first of the two and what led to the other very very good question well um stand up came first stand up came first because i did it i mean even as a you know teenager but it it, it would it didn't come first as a serious career pursuit what happened was i was at school of visual arts in new york and I was studying uh, screenwriting and filmmaking and um, and even acting. And um, the chairman of the school suggested that I take a class in advertising, thinking that, you know, I had that g- that kind of gene of being able to sell products, being able to, you know, uh, make that stuff interesting and lend myself to that medium. I, I resisted it in a way. And he was like, look, you're in New York city. You want to, you want to work. You, you know, we have an excellent course uh, of study here with some of the best ad people in New York, you know, just, just 
just take it, just dip your toe in it and see what happens. And I, and I did. And through that class, I ended up getting a job offer, um, which is cool in that it, it was, it was an area that, you know, sometimes you get invited to do a job that you didn't even know existed. I didn't even know that there were agents for directors of TV commercials. Like I thought there were agents and they get the people commercials, they get them, whatever they get. And I, and an agent was the last thing that I thought I would ever be. I thought I would be the talent. So I was like, I don't, I don't get it. You know, and I, I through a friend, I was introduced to someone who repped directors of TV commercials, editors, composers, visual effects, artists, all for TV commercials. And um, what it ended up doing was putting me very, very close to filmmaking because if you go get a job at at you know uh William Morris or something you're in the mailroom you have no role whatsoever you're not you're not really involved in anything in the commercial world if you're the agent for the for the talent the talent's actually treated really well in commercials in commercials the the directors were were gods like you know in the in that time in the early 90s you know um and so i ended up working with some very very big companies in that field and i got to be on set and in, interact with filmmakers all the time and that was just that was really cool you know and i and i wanted those people to know that I wasn't just an agent. I wasn't just a sales guy. I was a writer too. So I started writing their bios and that became my real career. I started writing their bios and press releases and writing about filmmakers, artists, all that stuff. I wasn't interested in being a journalist. I had too, I was too much of a, of a uh, kind of a fantasist, and I loved magic, you know, too much to like, you know, film magic and all that too much to be like a reporter. I didn't want to be a reporter, but I loved writing stories about creative people. So that meant that I became a publicist for for those people. And then I would get the odd copywriting job, you know, through my contacts there. Um, I did. I don't know that I've ever talked about this, but I did a. um I did a a, uh, a radio commercial. It was just a a spec thing. Like the the agency was pitching it, and so they need they wanted somebody to record it. And it was a Woody Allen. They wanted to get Woody Allen for it, and it was the opening of the Paramount Theater in uh, in New York. And so Paramount Studios was like, you know, the uh, the 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 major people that were behind it. So they said, oh, you know, Hirsch, um, could you write and record some of these scripts for Par for the Paramount Theater in like the style of Woody Allen? And I did, and I recorded it, and they played it for, um, I think it was Frank Mancuso, I think, who was the head of Paramount at that time. And he loved it and laughed on the phone. And I I remember like, and they're like, don't talk, you know, you're able to like, listen on the phone, but don't, don't talk, don't say anything. So you're mute, stay on mute. And I, and I listened to this play for this, this stu group of studio execs. And I was like, that was really cool. Like, you know, and in the end, uh, I don't think I got, I don't think they did anything with it or I didn't, I certainly didn't get paid on it, but I got like some freelance copywriting things, but I was like, I liked that. I, I I don't know that I liked it, but I but I was a fringe figure, so I didn't I didn't have to go to work in a big building every day and be put in an office and write commercials, but I was regarded by some of those people who did as good enough to do that. Same thing would happen with like emceeing gigs or stand up until I started really really getting good at it, but you know, where you could step into something and just it helped you flourish. That's what yeah. I keep on thinking in my mind. Yeah. It helped you, it helped you expand. And, yeah. It and helped climb. me expand yeah. and not, not be, and I wrote not be pigeonholed. Yeah. I wrote screenplays and, and, uh, 
you know, I, I got, was hired to write a few screenplays. They were genre films and, but I, but I, I cherish it now. It's like, I did think at varying times that I would be a screen. I mean, I, I did like a hundred meetings. I had a writing partner named John Burns, a very talented guy. And we wrote a number of screenplays and had an agent and a manager. And we, we did about a hundred meetings in Hollywood um, and never, and, and just didn't get a deal with, for something. And it's like, it was like, okay, I guess there are a lot of talented, hardworking, diligent people who don't get a deal. And, I, and, and, and at that point, after I, after the hundredth or so meeting, and we had a funny experience where these well-known, well-established producers were working with us on a project that we were working on for free. And, and it started out as a, um, it started out as a, uh, as a, a romantic comedy. And then under their guidance, it became a buddy action comedy and then became a not buddy, not comedy action movie, like kind of a fast and furious before the fast and furious type thing. And then still never got made. And we were like, Okay, man, we've done every single thing we could possibly do with this fucking idea. And it's like, and they're all good scripts. Like every one of these scripts are good and none of them are getting sold. It's like, we just got burned out. And we were like, okay, I'm going to, he's going to work in production. My partner, I'm going to work in, you know, in advertising again, you know, and, and, and just, you know, continue to, to see what happens, you know? But it's like, if you get that close and you don't do it, you have two choices. You can either stay with it because you want it that bad, or you can just move on to something that's a little less nerve wracking and a little less frustrating, you know? So you eventually and get tired of banging your head against the you wall. You get tired and, of, yeah, you yeah. get tired of the of yeah. the craziness and the randomness and the, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, I do know business. I get it. It's not even just the movie business. It can be anything in life that we really want to aspire to yeah. get, on, get on board with. And eventually you get to a point where next, right. Yeah. That was, that yeah. was part of a season of my life that, you know, it was not what I wanted it to be, but what did I learn from it? Move on. Right. Yeah. Sometimes it means you go back to what, we're comfortable with like you went back to advertising you go because you got to still you still got to make money you got to feed yeah. your family you got to take care yeah. of yourselves but your dream never truly died though did it no no and in fact i don't have for a long time i had regrets because i thought there was if i had committed to it you know full time like if i had committed to the comedy thing from the age of 20 not gotten married not had kids not moved to California to 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 continue to work in commercial filmmaking, not, you know, not remarry, got a divorce. If I had just focused on just being a stand-up comedian, I could have, I would have made it. And that and the funny thing is though, like, would that have been what I wanted? I chose all these other things that gave me all these other rewards that I that I wouldn't trade now. So did I really make the wrong decision? Well, if I wanted to be, you know, a really rich, successful, lonely stand-up comedian, I probably could have accomplished at least some degree of that. I, I, I'm confident I could have made a living as a comic. I learned that much, but, um, but I just don't think that was really the the dream. I think the dream is today, like. Today is your dream. You know, I think, I think, uh, you know, Tony's Tony has a very matter of fact way of telling, of telling people, you know, that they, that you got to kind of put your, put your eyes on the prize and don't, don't bullshit yourself, you know, with, uh, with kind of excuses and, you know, so I have kind of a similar thing, which is, I think, I think, you know, today is the, is the dream you're, you're making. And, you know, tomorrow is another building block and yesterday was a building block and you're building to this dream and you're building this thing. 
but you know, don't have a preconceived notion about what your destiny is. Destiny is a fucked up word. Destiny is like, you know, it is. it's, it's so, it's so lame. If you think about it, it's like, well, dude, why are you, why are you so mad? Well, it's my destiny. To, it was my destiny to do. <laughs> it was my destiny to fail. No. Or it was my destiny to succeed as an iron word. That word is overused though. It's overused in the because, wrong context too. You know, I like you're, you're well suited. You're perfectly suited. You're really well suited to this objective is sounds a little less sexy, but it's much better than your destiny because your destiny is uh, is something that you won't know. A destiny is something you write in a history book because you can look in retrospect and say, oh, well, they were seem destined to do that. But don't put that in front of you, you know. I'm, well, I'm it's, 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 to, all, to it's almost a wall that so high that you can't climb. Yeah. And then yeah. people get in and hit that wall and don't know what to do next. And they fall back and do what I talk about all the time. They jump on a hamster wheel. Yeah. They, they, lo they lose a vision of a future. They forget that, you know what, you want something. Okay. Well, what are you going to do? What actions are you going to take? Well, what are your goals now? What yeah. are you going to do to put it in place? Oh, I really want that. Okay. Well, what are you doing? Well, I don't know. Well, okay. So you, it's a fantasy. It's not even a dream. A well, dream you can take and put into put a goal against a dream and go do actions to associate and get it. But I have people that talk about this is my destiny. I think, oh, that's your fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> I well, find, I don't know. find the right tools. It's like if yeah. you want to if you want to get over a wall, get a get a really tall ladder, not a hamster wheel. Exactly. Because, <laughs> because you're not going to get up there. You may feel like you're running really fast. You may feel like you're going to get to the top, but. It, but you're not, and you know what? Uh, if you looked at a really, really high wall and you found a nice set of, you know, uh, ropes and secure stuff and a ladder and an extension and a spotter and all this stuff, it would not be a very exciting, really, thing to have to do. I got to go up rung after rung, after rung, after rung to get to that thing, whatever that thing is. And it's like, most people are like, fuck this. <laughs> They're like, I'm not going to go on this. I'm not taking these. I'm not doing this thing. I'm, I'm tired. This is, this is boring. And then you're like, okay, that's right. So what you, what you're saying is the top of this wall is not interesting enough for you to do what you would have to do to get over it. You know, but don't think that creating a, a circus at the base of the of the wall is going to get you to the to the top. You know, yeah. it, don't hold on to a helium balloon and think it's going to carry <laughs> your weight up to the top of the top. Don't don't get up halfway and hold a helium balloon and then jump and hope that it takes you up <laughs> over the wall. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's there. There is it's interesting how people think. And their thought processes, and you know, we try we try coaching or or mentoring people like through our own life examples where we're the person that was stuck at the bottom of the wall. We were on that hamster wheel, thinking that if we run, we're going to get you know fast enough, we're going to get up the wall. But the truth and harsh reality is, is you need to find people that are going to help you understand the processes because we aren't necessarily taught it in school the processes of how to get over that wall right. it's not you know like you said you know we have a ladder you have some ropes you have all this stuff you have some spotters well when you said spotters i thought associations mentors uh -huh. who's going to help us so that when oh, we yeah. go up 10 rungs of that ladder and we and we have something happen in our life and we go down three rungs they're going to be going that's okay you went down three rungs but guess what you went up seven. You mm -hmm. did seven rungs and you and you hit the tenth and came back three. That's nothing. Re, you know, recheck yourself, reassess, move on. Mm -hmm. This is the things that I see that you you know what I mean. So that's when you said spotter. I thought associations, mentorship, support, that's friends. Great. Well, well, that's true. And I think in terms of of uh, you know society, I mean it's a whole bigger conversation, but. Let it suffice it to say that I don't know that that 
the societal infrastructure is designed for our self-actualization, right? It's 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 not designed to be it's not designed where you come into the world and someone says to you, "Hey, what's your wall?" You know, and they go, "Oh, well, this is my wall." And then they go, "Okay, well, I'm going to introduce you to someone who who knows how who's climbed those walls before that happens much later in life once we've already gone through a lot of bullshit and a lot of a lot of all the other crap right and Absolutely. and had people say oh uh, uh that that wall yeah we well, can't climb that that's not for you that wall's not for you that's not for us we don't do that what do you mean that's not our we don't do that wall we don't do walls like that here's a wall Here's a wall you can climb till 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 the day you die, and it's 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 you're never going to stop running out of rungs. And it's like, well, what's what's the wall for? It's for us. It's our wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the wall. It's the same wall that we all climb. That every every everyone in our family for generations has climbed climb that wall. You know, yeah. and we're so, like, so. well, you don't necessarily, yeah, just because somebody else. And your family or history or associations climbed a wall doesn't mean that's like you said your wall to climb. That's maybe right. It's just, maybe it's just meant for everybody else, and that's their their wall to climb. And you need to find another wall, right? Because right. not all walls look the same, people. Right? They're they not. just don't. They just don't. So, man, what a great conversation we could actually go for hours here. But I wanted one of the things I want to touch on though is. You operate on one simple pre principle, and we've talked about sell the truth. Is there anything yeah. in your life that led you to this principle, such as betrayal or deceit? What led you to for that to be your main principle that you would ad adhere to? That's a great. That's a great way of framing that, Dwight. Because it's like I don't, you know. Um, I, I don't, it's a, you know, it's funny. I, I finished this draft of the book. I should probably have like something, uh, uh, really on hand that I, uh, like a pull quote that I could, that I could just throw at you. And there probably is something. Cause often, I don't know if this happens to you, but often I'll, I'll come up with stuff that I'll write down and it'll be perfect, but I don't necessarily have access to it in a, in a given moment. Cause I, I get it. it happens you know, all the time, but, but. I'll just answer the question as best I can, which is, I think that it snuck up on me when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do after the pandemic, right? Or in the wake of, or the midst of the pandemic. What, what, what was my, what, like to, to Tony's question, what was I going to do when it was all over? Where did I want to be when it was all over? So I, I, realized um i started writing a comedy show called truth tastes funny and at the same time i had this idea for a book called selling the truth and it was the funny thing was i didn't i hadn't done a podcast i hadn't done uh the truth tastes funny podcast but i bought the url selling the truth book which was which i had not even done what selling like i hadn't even figured out what it meant but something about truth came up in both you know contexts and i was like okay so my show about truth tastes funny is about how to survive and thrive in a chaotic world and during the pandemic i started a uh an instagram tv account called three times daily comedy and i thought comedy you know that we can't get around this pandemic. We can't go anywhere. I can only be in my house with my kids and my wife, and I can, I can go outside, and I have the dog, but I don't have any. I don't have no other real immediate interaction with anybody in the real world. So I'm just going to film my world as different characters. So I'm going to come out. I'm going to do different characters: British character, Irish character, Australian character. Uh, you know what. Some of them may be men or women, I don't know, in my own mind, like they 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 may have a feminine quality or something, but they they're probably gonna come across as a man or a, uh, you know, but I'm gonna create all these characters with all these points of view, and they're gonna cope with the pandemic for me. 
right? And I think the the reality of that, of what we were facing, married with the humor, which may have been too soon, right? Like, you know, we say, oh, too soon. It's too soon. But with some time, that could be funny. In this moment, we had no time. We were like, we may have no time at all. We may catch this thing, God forbid, and like have a fatal case of it. You know, like we don't know if we have any time. Um, I had a friend who who tragically in the very, like in April of 2020, died of COVID at 51. And like that was just one of those things, you know, like wasn't my best friend, but was a very good friend of mine's best friend. And so I, I could appreciate the, 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 the real agony of it. And it was like, boom, you know, like, I, like, wow, that took somebody fast, you know? And, um, and so you couldn't really run away from reality. So I think at that moment, I really was on a trajectory that was not going to run away from the truth. And I think that as I started to find a way to merge um, comedy and branding, which became Yes Brand, um, you know, I think I was already in that mindset of you're not going to get anywhere bullshitting anybody. I never have as a publicist or as a copywriter or anything ever tried to bullshit anybody. So I wasn't a spin doctor. I wasn't a bullshit artist and I wasn't like, you know, a snake oil salesman. So I was never, I was never full of shit in my, in my work. And I was like, well, that's timely that I have somehow some, some, loyalty to reality, to the truth, but I also have a sense of humor about it. And I'm doing a podcast that, and a stage show that, you know, draw on the absurdity of life without running away from it. I'm starting to do fewer vo character voices and things in my comedy because I'm s ceasing to run away from whoever I am. So, and so I think it, it all came from that, but I'm sure that there is an origin to it that starts in childhood. Like that if you go back to that childhood and we go back to what we started talking about in the beginning, the trauma, the, you know, the Holocaust, the generational stuff, whatever that weight that, as I said, was visible in my, like it was a part of the world that I was born into and I knew it. You know, like I remember learning even about Kennedy's assassination. I mean, I was born in 66, so I was born after Kennedy was assassinated, after both Kennedys were assassinated, after Martin Luther King was assassinated. But I was also born really, you know, in that era. So my when I started to look back at my childhood and where my my parents were at in their lives, when I was born and when my sisters who are older than me were born, that's what that my sisters were born into. That's what my parents were going through when we were born. All these assassinations, you know, Vietnam, all this stuff. And so I think that there was always a sense of a very scary world out there that you couldn't really escape. You know, if I became an actor, I would maybe be escaping into character. If I became a comedian exclusively, maybe I would have been escaping into, maybe I knew that those things were not escapable. And so the artifice of theater and comedy and acting and screenwriting didn't do it for me. Didn't, you know, didn't uh, solve that problem for me. Maybe if anything, all of it crystallized. And I realized, you know, a couple of years ago that there is no running from anything. And you took off the mask. And I took off the mask very well put and said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to accept it. I'm going to accept it and deal with it and see where we can go.
And then if I'm still going to be in branding, it only makes sense to say, I'm not going to be one of the people who tries to figure out how do you navigate the truth around the truth, right? You're how do you get it. around the truth? We're going to have to, no, we're going to have to, we're going to have to not only embrace the truth, but sell it. We're going to have to confront it so hard. And that's what, and that is what I tell clients. Like, you know, you're going to have to confront your reality of who you are and what you stand for so hard that you can actually sell it to your customers. And if you can't, or if you can't bring yourself to sell it to your customers, then you're doing something wrong, right? Something's wrong and you're going to fail. You may fool them for a little while, but they're you're going to fail. And you may be fooling them. I cover this in the book. I mean, you may be fooling them out of a well-intended, you, you may be lying to yourself as much as you're lying to your customer. You're not maybe trying to get over on them, but you do, you're, you're going to fail. Hirsch, this conversation has been unbelievable. We've gone all over the map. Unfortunately, though, we're running out of time, but I think it would be an injustice to my listeners, to you and I, to stop it here. So I think we should do a part two of this great conversation because I have so many more things I want to delve into, dive into, pardon me, in regards to what you offer people. And the, the whole idea of truth and selling the truth is fascinating. And I know it's fascinating to many people because we've hidden beside, or pardon me, behind a facade most of our lives that society helps us do. And we need to seek the truth. We need to seek people like you and your information and what you share with others is invaluable and something that I want to continue to learn more about. So listeners, Hirsch has agreed to do a part two. We're going to wrap this up. We'll keep my, you know, question that I ask about, you know, Hirsch, if he's going to share something with others about giving a heck, what would that be? We'll leave that to part two. I look forward to part two. I look forward to you listening to it, inquiring, sending comments, reaching out to Hirsch to find out about his book. I look forward to the book to come out, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's so many people hide from the truth. So thanks, Hirsch. We're going to wrap this up. So listeners, stay tuned for part two. And Hirsch, I appreciate all your time investing into the Give a Heck podcast and into serving others up the truth. My pleasure, brother. I'm, I'm glad to do it and happy to, to resume. Yes, we'll talk in part two. Thank you for taking time out of your day and listening to Give a Heck. If you find value, I'd appreciate you sharing with your friends and family so they too can learn how to live life on purpose, not by accident. So you do not miss the next episode. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and please also post a review. I look forward to reading your comments. This has been Dwight Heck. If you want to check out other podcast episodes or today's show notes, please check out my website, giveaheck.com and until next time together let us all strive to give a heck